Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to another live chat on B-Ball Breakdown. Today I'm pleased to welcome Chuck, excuse me, as I turn my thing off, uh, we we're pleased to welcome Chuck Swirsky, the radio play-by-play -play announcer for the Chicago Bulls. So, uh, Chuck, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for the invitation to come on with you. My pleasure. I have some echo going on that I would, I'm going to eliminate right now. Thank you. Okay, so sorry, but uh, sorry about that little glitch. Uh, welcome everybody who's here, and I thought we could start out by um, basically talking about uh, Chicago Stadium, which yes. is one of the places that makes you know me excited when I think about Chicago, um, because I grew up there and I was going, I went to all those games back in the day, and um, I thought you could kind of give us some insights to what that was like. Well, it was a great experience. I um... I moved to Chicago in 1979, and um, I'll tell you what, the Bulls were so bad during a period of time. Everyone remembers the Jordan era, and now, of course, with Derrick Rose, but the Bulls had some lean times, and uh, it was so bad that the Rats would leave at halftime. And <laughs> so, I mean, uh, but it was a great, great building. It was loud. It had character. It had appeal. It was Chicago. Um, if the building walls could talk, oh my goodness, it would be a bestseller. Uh, but the intimacy in that building and the electricity, uh, night after night, whether it was for basketball or hockey, it was a magnet of enthusiasm. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, I was there um, when you know when in, in, from the beginning. I think I, my first game was probably 1979 when we was watching you know Artis Gilmore and. Oh Richard. yeah. A little bit later, uh, and you, now you actually did the public address announcing for that time, didn't you? That's correct. I did it for uh, three years, and it was a lot of fun. In those days, you know, um, where the scores table now, the scores table, uh, more people involved with the scores table at an NBA game. Uh, you have people now that uh, are, you know, obviously uh, have the abilities financially to sit on the floor. In those days, it was primarily about five of us at the scorer's table, and the benches of the respective teams were very close. And so we heard everything, and I'm talking everything, and it was unbelievable. It really was. Uh, can you give us an example of something you might have heard that was uh, kind of funny or interesting? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll share one quick story with you. Jerry Sloan was the head coach of the Bulls, and uh, I'll, I'll remember they were playing the Dallas Mavericks, and Dick Mata was the head coach of the Mavericks, and Dick walked all the way to midcourt. In those days, they didn't have coaching boxes. Of course, nowadays, they have coaching boxes, but they don't really because the officials just let them go, and if you, know, if you want to coach, coach, and whatever. But Dick Mata comes all the way to midcourt, and uh, the Bulls are running a play. And, um, and I, I won't mention the player in question, but Dick Mata is screaming, let him go, let him go, just let him take the jumper, he can't shoot, he can't shoot. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm thinking, whoa. And so um, what happened, the player misses the shot, and Dick Mata turns to us and says, hey, I'm pretty smart, aren't I? Didn't I tell you he can't shoot? <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. Dick Mata might have also felt a little bit more at home since, you know, he coached the Bulls yes. before that. Uh, and, in fact, he, he coached Jerry Sloan in, in probably the pre-Jordan, um, you know, uh, heyday of when the Bulls were, were good, which I think is before you too as well, right? Yeah. I, um, I mean, I remember those teams. Uh, actually, I remember – here's another story regarding Dick Mata. But I'm, um, I'm, I'm ready to go to grad school in Seattle. And I got a part-time job at the radio station, an all-news station in Seattle, Cairo Radio. And they would send me to Sonics games and, you know, go in the locker room and get those 20-second sound bites. And so that year in 77-78, the Sonics are playing the Washington Bullets for the championship. Now the Wizards, of course, they changed the nickname. And Dick Mata is the head coach. So now it's a crazy series. And 
They're playing Game 7 at the Seattle Center Coliseum, now the Key Arena, which is the home of the Seattle Storm of the WNBA, no NBA team, of course. But so it's Game 7. The game started at 6 o'clock Seattle time. The game was taped delayed on CBS at 10 o'clock. Okay, believe it or not, this is how old I am. So um, I'll never forget, I'm good friends with Jack Sigma, Wally Walker, and you know we're talking about where we're going after the championship game. This is the day before because, come on, game seven, you're in Seattle, crowd at the uh, Coliseum is going crazy. It's great. So I'm thinking this is going to be fantastic. I'll be hanging out with Jack Sigma, Wally Walker, Tom Lagarde, uh, Joe Hassett after the game. This is going to be great. <laughs> and so what happened, if, if you look at that game, late in the fourth quarter, uh, Mitch Kupchak picked up a loose ball and laid it in. He got just inside position on uh, Marvin Webster, the human eraser. And Kupchak had one of the biggest shots in the series, and he scored, and he got fouled, and the Sonics lost. And the place, game seven, you lose on your home floor in a game seven. So Dick Mata was the head coach. I go in the locker room. There's Dick Mata hugging Elvin Hayes and Wes Unseld. And Wes Unseld was giving Elvin Hayes a bear hug. And I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty bizarre. So that's my Dick Mata story. Because he had that thing, the, the, you know, it, it's not over until the fat lady sings. That was his whole mantra, the whole series. You know, it's interesting, a little tidbit about Dick Mata, who, um, you know, I, I've been trying to find to try and talk to him about the history of basketball. Do, do you know what he does now? He runs a bed and breakfast. Uh, I can't get anything by you. I, I he, in Somewhere like in Montana, right, him and his wife, is, you know, he's a former yeah, NBA I, coach. I, yeah, NBA I think it's in Idaho. Oh, Idaho, excuse me. But that's amazing. You could go to a bed and breakfast and be served or be whatever by a former NBA coach and NBA champion. Um and, you know, I've done the breakdowns from the, the Bulls in that era, and i got to tell you, uh, they really played. That was the way you're supposed to play basketball. You know what? It was probably the best team never to win a championship during that period of time. The two teams, in my opinion, that – and I'm a historian of the NBA, and I love the game, and I love the league. Uh, but the two teams, in my opinion, that were so good that never won uh, was the – Jerry Sloan, Norm Van Leer, Chet Walker, um, you know, uh, the Norm uh, Van Leer, we mentioned him, Tom Borwinkle, that group, uh, Clifford Ray, uh, Bob Love, that group, and the Cleveland Cavaliers of the late 80s and early 90s, with, because Cleveland was loaded. But they ran into Jordan year after year after year and never got to the finals. Well, you know, I think you can say that for any of the teams that that the Bulls beat with Jordan. Honestly, uh, those those were all very good teams. Yeah, they were. You're right. And 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 a really good segue to my other point I wanted to bring up with you, since since you're a historian as well, is that I'm going through uh, both Game Sixes from '97 and the NBA Finals in '98, which will be posted, uh, I think, tomorrow, hopefully. And um, I don't know if you realize this, because I certainly watched every minute of every second of that game, and I was there for those games. But uh, in Game Six, there was a reverse layup that Shandon Anderson missed, and it would have but put them up by two. I, I'm sorry, it would have put, put them up by one, I believe, and then you know, Steve Kerr wouldn't have won down there. But Scottie Pippen puts his hand in the rim and and yanks it. It shakes the rim, and when the ball hits up there and misses, it's because Pippen. Well, obviously, it doesn't matter. It's a goaltender, no matter what he does when he puts his hand in there. Nobody saw it. I don't yeah. remember anybody even talking about it back then. Do you do you remember that at all? I, I sure do, and I'll tell you. Let me let me tell you something. I have spoken to a couple of head coaches from that era that are no longer coaching, and they are convinced that the Bulls under Jordan got more breaks. Again, it sounds sour grapes twenty years after the fact or whatever, twenty five, but they are convinced that. During the period when Jordan came in the league and the league took off with marketing and TV and money, and Jordan was on national TV every week, I mean every week, whether it was TNT, whether it was you know, ABC, whatever, 
the bottom line is that the, they are convinced the officials gave him the benefit of the doubt, whether it was carrying and palming the ball. If you look, and, and God bless him, because, hey, he's Jordan. But if you look at the way Michael Jordan dribbled the ball, especially w w how he would extend his arm, palm the ball, bring it back, okay, and then all of a sudden he'd pin the ball on his hip, he'd cradle the ball under his armpit, bring it out, and then he would take that one pivot step, he'd turn the ball on the side, okay, on his hand, on the palm, and before he even put the ball on the floor, boom, first step and out. And then he would put the ball on the floor. By that time, the defender is going, whoa. And to this day, if you look at old Jordan tapes, um, you know, he, he probably carried the ball a lot. Yeah, well, but, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I Certainly in the beginning, I, I remember that a lot more. I feel like as he got more efficient and the teams got better, um, it, it just didn't feel that way. And it certainly, you know, you could argue that he, he would get all the foul calls going to the basket. And I think that changed later. I, I just read the reread the Jordan rules again, and they're going on and on in that book about how he doesn't get those same calls he used to get all the time. So, um, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. And certainly if they had a, someone to protect, they needed to protect their, you know, the they're the star of that league. And by the way, are you allowed to talk that way about Michael Jordan? <laughs> no, I mean, I love Jordan. I'll tell you what, without Jordan, you know, people say, well, he came in the era of magic and bird and whatnot. No, 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 no. The way I look at it is they came in his turf because uh, we, have, we, we have, and you know, all this comparison with LeBron James, LeBron James, when it's all said and done, will probably end up as a top three to five player ever to play the game. But for my money and for what Jordan did night after night after night after night after night and to win those championships, and again, it wasn't just Jordan. He had a lot of help from other people. But the truth of the matter is Jordan is the greatest player I've ever seen and the second greatest player I've ever seen in the twilight of his career. But I do remember him, and that was Oscar Robertson. Those are the two greatest players and the third greatest player, and I only saw him as a little boy because the Sonics had an expansion team in the mid to late 60s, and he was gone by that time. He played one year against the Sonics, and that was Bill Russell. I think because Bill Russell revolutionized the whole game with his defense, and I hate to say this because he gets penalized for being the biggest guy in, on the planet during his era. Wilt Chamberlain, to me, still doesn't get the due respect he should, but because he was well and big and strong and did the finger rolls and whatnot, you have to look at how many rebounds he got per game. And he was getting beat up night after night by smaller people who just wanted to take wax at him. And the officials basically said, go at it. It's David and Goliath. Oh, I, you know, I'll have to send you a link. I'm sure a lot of people here have seen, but we, I broke down the 1962 All-Star game when Oscar was in his prime and Wilt. And I got to tell you, when you watch him run down the court as a seven foot, you know, yeah. 240 pound, whatever he was, I mean, he's faster than any guards you see out there. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have been as dominating now. Certainly oh. not because there aren't any any great centers as much as there used to be, but uh, there's no question that Will do. Here, you know, all those guys, even a guy like Michael Finley, in my mind, will be forgotten unnecessarily because here's a guy who scored, you know, 25 a game for seven straight years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's sort of a footnote. And, you know, Sigma's the same way. I mean, certainly. Well, Sigma around, should be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, uh, I, he's not in the Hall of Fame? No. I don't, I don't understand why he's not in the Hall of Fame. I don't get it. I, all I can tell you is that when we do, when, when I was, uh, you know, a manager at, 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 uh, in college, we do all of our big man skills. We had the McHale, which is up and under. You had, um, and you had the Sigma, which is like a, a, a pivot and a turn, right. a, a turn around jump shot. I mean, he, and that's still to this day, I'm pretty sure people still use the Sigma as the name of the move. So, uh, he, yeah, that whole, that whole Seattle team is really, really good. And, um, you, you know what? Uh, Minnesota was just in town the other day, and I saw Jack, and I've known Jack for 35 years. He's a great man. He, I hope one day he gets to be a head coach because he really wants to. And for whatever reason, people are not hiring bigs to be a head coach, which I don't understand. But um, I was talking with a scout 
of another team, and he was watching Sigma work out with some players, and he goes, you know that guy? Everyone tries to teach the Sigma move, and players, for whatever reason, they can't put the brain into their uh, motor uh, memory and get it down. He said that that is something, he said, who else in the league has mastered or even come close to the Sigma pivot? And yeah. I was thinking about that. I, I don't know. Well, I would think that Tim Duncan has kind of got probably the closest to it, and when he hits that shot off of, off of uh, the backboard, that would probably be the closest thing you could see. But you're right. Like, Ronnie Cycler used to be great at it um, yeah. back in the day. But here's this. We were talking about Isaiah Thomas and, you know, who the greatest point guard of all time, and everyone's arguing Stockton. And, you know, I think Oscar got up almost to the top there behind, you know, maybe Magic in my mind. But everybody forgets Gus Johnson. Yes. And, then, and, and, and Gus Johnson – Gus Johnson was a tenacious, no holds bar player. His offense very underrated, but defensively he made his mark. And the playoff series, the old Baltimore Bullets would have with the New York Knicks and Gus Johnson and Dave DeBusher, and I mean, it went beyond com competition. It was hatred. And when I say hatred, I'm not talking personal, although I'm sure they had a few words. But I'm talking about when they went on the floor, there was no high five and hugs and handshakes and love taps and all that stuff that we're seeing now. Um, it was okay. You know what? I'm wearing the blue and orange. You're wearing the white, blue, and orange, and we're going at it. Okay? This is the way it is. And, you know, Gus Johnson, who probably passed away maybe 15, 20 years ago, whatever, uh, to me was such an incredible for he was a power forward in every sense of the word. One of the best players in the history of this game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, about Chicago and sports in general, and like and what that means. You know, I, I think a lot of people here probably don't necessarily recognize so easily what um, you know how passionate people are when you're talking about Chicago. Can you give us a little insight into what that's like? Well, yeah. I mean, and you see the logos. I mean, the Bears are the Bears. I think they're going to the Super Bowl. Uh, everyone talks about their defense. Their defense is fantastic. Their offense, trust me, their offense is very balanced. The White Sox came close to winning the division, um, and they had a three-game lead on Detroit with a couple of weeks to go and just couldn't seal the deal. But Kenny Williams is a very aggressive general manager, uh, and I like Robin Ventura's temperament. The Cubs, well, the Cubs are the Cubs, but let me tell you what. They've got some players on their farm system, and Theo Epstein is going to get it done. Uh, the Blackhawks, you know, won the Stanley Cup a couple of years ago. They have a great organization. The uh, president came over from the Cubs about five years ago, and John McDonough, who's probably the, one of the best executives in sports today, period. And then you got the Chicago Wolves, and, um, you know, the Wolves are – um, maybe as far as uh, a, as a professional group, one of the most consistent hockey programs on the map. They just, you know, they're, they're shadowed by, of course, uh, the Blackhawks, but they've turned out prospects, uh, no doubt about that, and then the Chicago Fire, and uh, the Fire draw very well here in Chicago regarding soccer. Mm -hmm. And, and talk a little bit about the passion, what the, how the, what the fans bring to uh, any tip, a typical you know, professional sports game, no matter what sport it is. Well, I mean, the Cubs averaged 38,000 a game for a team that lost 100. Uh, and so what does that tell you? I mean, the Blackhawks lead the NHL in attendance. The Bulls lead the NHL in attendance. There's a waiting list of 25 years to get season tickets for the uh, Bears. The White Sox... Yeah, I, I wish I could put my hand on the White Sox fan base. They're very loyal. They average around $2 million a, uh, a season, but they deserve better. They really do. And, um, you know, the, the organization is doing everything humanly possible to reach out. But the problem is they don't play uh, at Wrigleyville, and they don't have Wrigley Field, and it's a shame. Uh, the fire attendance is great. Wolves attendance is solid at uh, Allstate Arena, and the fans just eat, live, and breathe sports here. 
That's right. I mean, I always feel like you can't go um, you can't go two blocks without hearing a, a radio show or seeing the TV on the game or somebody wearing something or a sign or anything. And, and I'm always sort of startled when I go back and visit, having grown up there and now I'm in L.A., uh, it's, you know, which is not a sports town in the same kind of way. Uh, it's, it's, when you're gone, you come back, that's when you really discover what, what that's really about. And I, here's what I, wanted, I, I thought we could do is, one, I, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of some, some icons here, and you can comment on, on who these people were and how they fit into the landscape. Okay, this is uh, Bob Love, and uh, Bob uh, works for the Bulls organization, an incredible jump shooter. I mean, look at the arc and the form of that elbow and the wrist action, and the, the, the jumper is a beautiful thing to see. He was a prolific scorer, to say the least. And I, as I remember, he would actually hold the ball over his head while he was standing there, and it was impossible to tell if he was about to shoot it or pass it. Yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, look. I mean, that, that that is a great picture. It really is. Uh, here's actually a really good, a really good question. I don't have the answer, but answer. But who is guarding, who is guarding him? Uh, that's John Block. Wow, wow. Okay, okay. now you want to ask yourself as yourself as someone who knows me. It's for John, 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 what team would that be? Um, it looks like, because they, the, uh, the name is, um, the name is under the uniform number. Right, right. Um, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I'm going to look up. He went to Southern Cal. I know that. Are you still with me? Do you lose me? No, no, no. no, 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 no it's okay. I'm, 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 I'm with you. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, um, it's, it's, okay. it's what the internet's for. Okay, John Block. Uh, let's see. Yep, he, he's 6'10". At a, uh, I'll tell you the uniform he was with. He was with uh, the Kansas City Omaha Kings. They put the name. Be high underneath the number. He played for the Lakers, Rockets, Bucks, 76ers, Kings, Jazz, and Bulls. Wow. Wow. All right. That's all right. This is great knowledge, knowledge coming from Buck here. Chuck here. All right. Let's go. All right. Let's go to the next one. Yep. The Fridge. Um, you know, here's a guy that uh, was a defensive tackle, but people remember him, obviously, uh, for, you know, carrying the football and running over George Cumbie. Uh, of the Green Bay Packers on Monday Night Football, uh, scoring a touchdown in the Super Bowl. And, um, you know, he's not doing well health-wise right now in his hometown of Aiken, South Carolina. But what a character. I was in that locker room. I covered the 85 Bears. I did the Bears pre-app and post for close to, um, let's see, I did them for 11 years on the, Bull, on the Bears Radio Network. And he was great. And he, just a fun-loving guy. You know what's funny? You know what's funny about that is, you know, in 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 uh, you know what? You're you're coming in and out. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay now? Uh, well, I'm getting a little bit of a, a feedback of a um, echo, but that's all right. That's all right. Okay. We got a couple okay. more minutes, and then I got to get to South Bend. You got it. All right. You got it. All right. So let's do uh, uh, the next, next one. one. Sorry, let me hit the little screen. The little screen here, button. And, and yeah, we got a couple yeah, more. Yeah, we got a couple more, and then we'll be done. Um, there you go. The greatest player ever. This okay. is a slam dunk contest, okay. and. Um, uh, Not much more I could add. I mean, that is like wow, wow. Yeah, greatest, yeah. greatest, was, greatest ever. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that's the line. The line's on the old school, old school stadium. The stadium. I was there for that too. That was an amazing time, amazing time in Chicago. I mean, this, this is how old it is that, that that picture you saw on the scoreboard. Look who the advertisers are. Gatorade still, you know, going strong. Coca Cola speaks for itself. And they aver we were advertising tobacco. How about that? Yeah, yeah, crazy. It's crazy. It and how about this? How about this guy? Ryan Sandberg. I, I remember the day he was traded by Philadelphia to the Cubs. People didn't know who he was. You know, had a horrendous slump to start his career as a Cub. And then all of a sudden, 
bam, the green light went on, and he just had a magnificent career. You you what uh, you you the, the the sound from it's not clear, so I couldn't understand. Um, um, okay, let me see here. Let me see. Um, um, is it any better? Any better right now? No, no. Uh oh, uh oh. Well, well. Oh, how about, oh, how about now? Uh, a little bit better. A little okay. bit better. Oh, well, I think. Oh, I think. I think. I Any better? Any better right now? No, no. I'm getting some. I'm getting some. I'm getting some. My internet. My internet. All right. Or someone. Or someone is. Uh, well. I guess. I guess. Are you hear me at all? Hear me at all or no? Uh, I can. I can barely hear you. There's an echo and it's distorted. But um, all right. all right. you know what? I mean, it's been great talking Chicago sports. So thank you for the invite. You got it. Thanks. You got it. Thanks. And, and you know what? We have to watch again. We'll actually talk about the Bulls from this year. If you can't, then maybe we'll do it. Uh, as soon as we can. So, because uh, uh, I, uh, I got some more questions for you. We'll come up next time. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, soon. Back on the ball breakdown. Thank you. Thank you.